Welcome to another Casual Friday. So today I want to talk about getting yourself out of a knitting rut, um, or at least getting myself out of a knitting rut. Um, so first I want to show you just kind of some things I've been working on this past week, and then uh, I'll talk about ruts in past and present. Last week I talked about trying to experience new yarns, like what I can do so I can learn more about different yarns because I tend to think a lot um, uh, when I'm looking at a project, like creating a particular product, I start with the product or the project and then I think about what I want that to look like and then, and then eventually get to the yarn. And so I have a really hard time if I start with the yarn and I'm trying to think of what product can I create from this. And I decided, oh, I don't need to worry about that. I just need to think of that as an opportunity um, to explore with process. And that I just buy a single skein of the yarn and try it out. So I, this week, I didn't buy new yarn. I used my leftovers. Um, from the yarn, the chainette yarn that I had knit with last week. I really liked it. So uh, I was just, I didn't have a ton of leftover yarn, but I wanted to see how this yarn would work in, say, seed stitch, uh, ribbing, and cables, because those are going to be some things I would commonly use uh, a solid color yarn like this with. I wanted to see how the texture of the yarn affected the smoothness of, of smooth stitches like stockinette and how it affected um, the texture of textured stitches like seed stitch and cables. So I did a, a very small swatch and one of the things, I don't know if you can see this, Let's see if I can get it up. There, it's in focus. There we go. Um, it looks, it looks fine in seed, it looks great in seed stitch actually. Uh, what I was really impressed with was the cables, how round and full the cables are in this yarn. And um, so that, that was really interesting to me to learn that. So that was my, my thing I learned about yarn this week. In terms of projects, I only, I knit one sock, so I knit half a pair of socks, but this was, um, part of an exploration that I'm doing. I don't have any problem with process when I'm just trying to think of it in terms of a technique, like of a part of a project that doesn't have a whole thing attached to it necessarily. Um, Cause I want to do a new series on uh, videos on sock heels. I did peasant heels and short row heels last fall. And because I was really interested in not just how do you do this heel, like what are the standard instructions, because I think that those are easy enough to find. What's harder to find is specific instructions for modifying those types of heels in order to get a good fit. Because I avoided them for years because I they don't fit me and the instructions for modifications were always so vague. Well, I'll just add a couple stitches here or use a larger percentage there. Does, this just doesn't work. So, um, so for me, I want to understand more about different sock heels and not categorize them by, well, this type of heel is really good for people with high insteps. This one is really good for people with flat feet. That I, it's of some interest, but it's more interesting to me if every knitter has access to every type of heel. <laughs> Be either because they like the aesthetics of it or because in the particular sock that they want to knit, um, that construction would work really well with their stitch pattern. There's all kinds of reasons why you might want to try different kinds of, of uh, heels and just for variety's sake, but you need to know how to make them so that they fit instead of saying, oh, well, that one doesn't fit me. I can't use that one. Um, so I, I, I know a lot, a lot about heel flap and gusset construction and, and it's very straightforward to get that to fit. So I was interested in some of the other heel flap constructions that people commonly use and they talk about. Um, and typically these are heel flap constructions where the the selling point is, well, you don't have to pick up any stitches. And to me, um, you know, I'm not looking for a heel flap that where I don't have to pick up stitches. That's my favorite part of the heel flap and 
and gusset sock is picking up the stitches, but I have a very good process for doing that that gives a really good result and makes it pretty easy to do. Um, so I was more interested in, well, how are these other heel types constructed and and then how, like, what is the main, what is the math of it? Like, what is the architecture of this heel so that if you did need to make modifications, how would you do that? Because that's, that's what I'm looking for is how can, how can this heel be used to fit other people? And my, cause my assumption is always that because I have such a, a tall, um, high arch that, and long heel that, I will typically have to make some sort of an adjustment in order to make a particular heel work for me. So uh, one of the heels that I wanted to look at again, because I hadn't tried it since probably the first year that I was a sock knitter, and that's the strong heel. And it's not called the strong heel because it wears better than other heels. It's named after the person who created it. And that heel was first, apparently it was described, or it, there was a an article on it in Knitters Magazine back in, I think, 2003, and it's a really hard issue to get a hold of. So this is before Ravelry. And I was in, and so before Ravelry, I was in these couple of Yahoo groups for sock knitting, and one of them, every two months, they had a new sock pattern. They'd have a free sock pattern. It'd be like a knit along. Here's the sock pattern, and here are the different interesting things about the sock where, that are different. And, uh, and then you have two months and you could upload your sock pictures and, and then you could see what other people did. And I remember, I remember this heel and remember thinking, well, I don't really like it as much because I really liked the heel flap and gusset, but I didn't understand it either. I mean, I was, I was just, cause I was so new to sock knitting. Uh, and I knit only the one sock. I didn't knit the second one. And then I've, I've never thought of it again because why do I want to avoid picking up stitches? So I thought, well, I want to look again at what the strong heel is. And then a lot of people who do toe up socks really like this flegal, flegal heel. And I don't like knitting to socks toe up. Um, so I, I, I've never looked at it. And again, you know, I have some heel constructions that work really well for me. And the selling point, again, is with the flegal heel, it's a heel flap style um, sock where you don't have to pick up stitches. So I looked up the answer and the flegal heel came out, I think around 2007. So right around the time Ravelry came out and it was posted in a blog. So it's available online, whereas the strong heel you have to try to find other people's descriptions of them. It's a little harder to find the instructions. And uh, so, so I found the instructions and I uh, kind of charted it out so I could see what was going on. And, and, I, and I knit it on, let's see, which one is this? So I knit the strong heel on a, like a worsted weight thing. I have a little foot model thing. I tried it on to see how it worked and um, and I thought, well, geez, you know, the heel diagonal is quite a bit longer than it is with a short, short row heel. And then I was reading people were saying, oh, the strong heel, it's too loose on their foot and it moves around. I thought, oh, okay. So this creates a, creates a, a sock heel with a larger diagonal than uh, a short row heel does. And so I was looking at that and then I looked up the instructions for the flegal heel, which is done, you know, toe up. And, and so that one, you know, starts at the toe and you have increases, whatever, and you have the, the back of the heel looks like this, um, with these, some short rows back and forth with decreases. And, but I was, I was looking at the instructions and I'm like, well, this is the same, the same thing as a strong heel, just as it has the decreases are pointed in different directions. So if you... <laughs> So, so this is the flegal heel that was knit from the pink up to the dark. And then this is the strong heel, which is started from the dark down to the pink. But if you turn it upside down in the direction that they were both knit, then you can see more clearly that it's, it's the same, it's the same heel. Um, and again, it's just that the, like one of these will have like a SSK on one side and a purl two together on the other. And then 
the, the other ones knit two together in SSP. And it's, there, it's the same thing. So, but then I started thinking about it and I'm thinking, well, how else can you do these increases? Like you don't have to place the increases at the sides where right, bef right by the instep, you could, you could really put them anywhere. You could put them at the back of the heel. So then I started um, playing with that. And so I put the, let's see if I can do this. Um, so I put the, the increases at the back and it creates this little kind of triangular flap at the back. I cannot do this and look in the monitor. So, um, so it gives a different look and it allows you to do a different sort of thing with, with um, the stitch pattern if you wanted to maintain it and just split it in the back uh, rather than putting the triangle somewhere in the middle here on each side. And so I thought, well, that's really interesting. So I thought, well, I'm going to try it in a sock. So that's what I did with the sock is I, I, I used the strong heel, but I placed the increases right here, starting in the back and then gradually out. And it just creates a different shape, but it fits me really well just the way it is, which is probably why it's too, too loose for, for a lot of people. Um, but this is the kind of thing that I like just like to experiment with and try to see how it works. I'm still working on figuring out the exact way to modify it for people who may have different size feet. Um, especially, you know, if they have a mismatch between their ankle and their foot or they have flat feet or really high arches, like ex an exact way to figure out how to make the heel so that it fits because that's the only way I think it's it's useful. So so to me this is a really good example of getting myself out of my rut. Like I just accept that I really like the heel normal heel flap and gusset construction and it works really well for me. I'm not looking for a better solution. With the short row heel I was like well okay I want to do that but I have to find a better way. So I really worked, worked hard on it. So this is the first time I really looked hard and experimented with another sort of heel flap construction, not because I needed to, but just because I wanted to see well, what, are, what are the selling points for me, not what is the selling point for somebody else. So somebody who doesn't like picking up stitches might love this type of heel, um, but that's not why I like it. I see other interesting design possibilities. And so I need to open my mind more to being less dismissive of something just because of the way other people are talking about it. So, I don't know, I think it was about 10 years ago, um, we went to England with my husband's extended family. Like there was 12 or 13 people from age three to you know, 73. So it's a huge range of people. And there were certain things that we were all going to be doing as a complete family, but we couldn't do all day, every day that way. You just can't do that with people maybe who have some mobility issues or kids who are little or, you know, there's just too, too much. So we had certain things that, that were being planned. And I had mentioned, um, in my uh, online writers group, I had mentioned that I was going to England and one of the women who, who lives in England uh, just jumped on that and said, is there any way that we can uh, get together and meet up? Because most of us were here in the United States and there's, there was a annual national conference that a lot of us would go to. And so we would, we would be able to get together once a year for a dinner, not everybody, but anybody who was at that conference. So a lot of us had met each other in person, but she was in England and she, you know, was mis feel kind of really longing to have that actual face-to-face per -face contact. And she says, is there any way that we can get together? And so I was looking at our schedule and trying to figure it out because she was up in Yorkshire and that's like a three hour train ride from London, which would mean that would be an entire day that I would, you know, leave the family, go up to see her and do whatever, and then come back. And so I looked at our schedule, like what, what are the days and or partial days where for sure we, we were all having to do something together. And I discovered that, well, the day after we got there, which would be the total jet lag trying to get 
acclimated day, that would be the day that I would have available to go up and see Rachel. So, you know, I checked with my husband and my kids, are you everybody okay with that? <laughs> and, um, and they were. So the morning after we flew in, it was like, I had to get up at like 4.30 or 5. It was already so discombobulated. Um, I got on a train up to Yorkshire. I was afraid to sleep on the train because I was afraid that I would just pass out and then miss, miss the station. And so I stayed awake on the train pretty much. And, um, she, you know, she said it's a small train station. It's not like the train station I got uh, that where I took the train from was King's Cross station. That's a huge, it's not just for the London underground. It's for, you know, British rail system. It's the train station, like in Harry Potter, where they have platform nine and three quarters. That's King's Cross station. It's just, that's huge. So that was where I was leaving from. Um, so, but I was going to Harrogate and, and so she said, oh, it's a, it's a small station. So in my brain, I'm thinking it's like an Amtrak station here in the U S which when I was a kid, we used to take Amtrak. And so, you know, you get off and there's like the little building there and, and that's it. There's you know, like, there's, you can't miss somebody. Um, so I get off and then I realize, oh, there's no way for somebody to meet you on the platform. You actually have to go into the, the station building. So I get into the station building and it's like, it's not just like a one room building. It's like there's, sh there's like a corridor and there's shops and all kinds of things. So it was, it was bigger than I thought. I mean, it, it was small, but it was bigger than I thought. And there's all these people coming and going. And I didn't know what Rachel looked like. <laughs> that was the thing. She didn't know what I looked like. And, and I didn't know what she looked like because all of our forums were all text-based. There were no photos. And that was the moment when I realized, wait a second. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should have asked her to send me a picture of herself so I could recognize her. Because then my thought was, well, she gave me her phone number, but I don't even know how I would call that for my cell phone without, you know, it didn't know how I was going to do that. What happened? What if she had a flat tire? What if, you know, what if she never showed up? Like, how long do I wait for? How long do I look for? And I was like, all these things. I was, again, I was like super tired and trying to think of all this. And I'm walking down this little corridor and then I see a woman just kind of leaned against the wall, you know, like this looking I'm like, oh, <laughs> like Rachel, just like rocks. So I'm like, oh, okay. So we found each other. And this is, it's only like nine o'clock in the morning by the time I, I got there. So we, we get in her car and she's got all these plants to show me all over the Yorkshire Dales uh, as much as she can. And um, so the first stop, and I had no idea, you know, I didn't know what there was to see. I didn't know what she had planned. I didn't know if we were just going to go somewhere and chat for three hours and I'd get back on a train and go back. I didn't know. I didn't know what we were going to do. So, um, so she took us, uh, she was driving along. She says, oh, I want to take you to the, uh, Fountains Abbey. And, um, okay. And she's like, it's the most, it's the most well-preserved, uh, Abbey ruins in England or, you know, something like that. I'm like, okay. So we get there and, um, and so there, you know, there's some partial walls, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a ruins, but you know, it's pretty, it is fairly well preserved. Like you could tell where certain parts of it were. And she had a little map and she's like, okay, well, here's the, the layout, the layout of, uh, the Abbey. And so we can tell where all the different parts were. And I'm like, well, how do you know that? She's like, well, all of the abbeys have this, this particular layout. And and I'm like, well, why are all the abbeys in ruins? <laughs> and she said, because Henry VIII, you know, when, when he split with the Catholic Church uh, and formed the Church of England, they just, he just, that was the first order of business was destroying all of the, the abbeys and the nunneries and all that kind of thing. And it's like, oh, okay. When was that? Well, like 15, you know, 20 or something like that. And um, so we're walking around and it was beautiful setting. And the thing, and I felt like I had to talk to her in hushed tones, like we were in a library or something. There were no other people around. There were no signs of any other hum of humans at all. Like there were no planes flying overhead. There were no cars driving by. There was no distant sounds of trucks rumbling or, or anything. It was both really quiet 
and really noisy. And it was really noisy because it was really quiet. So there were no human sounds, um, but I could hear this buzzing and I, I, it was a pretty loud buzzing and I thought maybe it was like a, um, a tower, like electrical towers or something. I'm looking around for towers and I'm like, what is that buzzing sound? She's like, oh, that's the bees. And I'm like, well, there are hives around here somewhere. She's like, no, it's just like the bees that were, there were enough bees out in the fields with all of the, where all the flowers were, you could hear the bees. And, you know, you could hear the birds tweeting and everything too, which, you know, I'm more used to that, but being able to hear bees just in the field. And then there were sheep and they were just, just wandering around, you know, they're just wandering around. It wasn't like they're fenced off anywhere. It's just sheep wandering around. And so that was like my first, like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know there were going to be sheep. I love sheep. You know, they, they provide wool, which makes yarn. So it was like a really, it was just a fascinating place to be. And so then she said, well, I want to also take you to, there's this brewery that they open at 11 and they had, they have tours and we can eat lunch there and stuff. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, well, they're not going to be open for a little while. So she pulled over on the side of the road somewhere. And she said, well, I brought a flask. Do you want a drink? And I'm thinking I'm American. And to me, a flask is like a little personal liquor bottle that you carry in your coat pocket and I'm thinking I don't think I should be drinking alcohol I don't think she should be drinking alcohol <laughs> like at 10 30 in the morning like and then we're going to a brewery and so she reaches behind her her chair her seat in the car and she brings us a thermos full of tea and she's got a little package of biscuits you know cookies and so we, we had some tea and I, I had I'm like oh I just started laughing and like I, you won't believe what I was trying to trying to figure out uh well, how I was going to handle you you know <laughs> doing a little drinking in the morning um so so we had our tea and biscuits and then we decided to go to the brewery and we get to the brewery and what is the brewery it is the black sheep brewery and big painted sh like sheep mural on the side of the of the building so that was delightful i'm like more sheep yay and um so we went, we went on the tour and we had our lunch and stuff and then she had a couple other places she's trying to race me around to uh so i can see it see all of it see everything and um so we went on she's like oh i want to there's uh she's telling me about the public land or public walkways or however it works so like you people own the land privately but there are some really ancient trails that um that have been there forever and people have the right to continue walking on those trails so it can be your private land but they have this trail and you and you can go on so she wanted to take me up to this um this trail somewhere and we parked, there was a very narrow paved area. So we parked where the paving ended because she didn't want to take her little car on the rutted road. And we're walking up, up the hill again. There's sheep just wandering around, mama sheep and her lambs and wandering around. And, um, and then she's like pointing at this road and she's like, oh, well, that's a Roman road. And I was like, what do you mean it's a Roman road? And she's like, well, the Romans built it, <laughs> you know. So for a girl from the Midwest that, you know, you know, just trying to comprehend that this road has like the Romans, like this is an actual road. It's not just a little walking path that people have been using. This is a road that they built, I don't know how many years ago, a thousand years ago or more, 2000 years ago. I don't know how, far, how long ago. It's crazy. So, um, so, you know, I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I went up there. And then I saw these wonderful things that have nothing to do with knitting, but the sheep did. And that was just like a little del delightful thing for me that, oh, that's an unexpected surprise that I really love. I mean, this is really interesting and that's really interesting. This other thing's really interesting. But then every place we went, there were there were sheep. And so I just, I just loved it. So we went back down to London that night and then um, we were doing all of our family stuff and there was going to be one, there's going to be one day like on a Sunday where everybody, we we're all going to go on this little 
tour. We're going to have a guide and on a little shuttle bus. And we were, we weren't sure exactly which location, but that was going to be on Sunday. So everybody had to know on Sunday, we have to be up at a certain time ready for that. So the Saturday though, I was like, well, I'm going to get up first thing in the morning. Does anyone want to go to the Victoria and Albert Museum with me? Nobody wanted to go. So, cause I wanted to get up really early and I wanted to go there because I had looked up on the internet like a month before I come across it. And I thought, oh, I want to see this when I go. They, they have these display of, of really early knitting, like three or 400 year old knitting of different things that I'd seen on the internet. This is 10 years ago with my not great resolution screen. And I wanted to be able to like stare at it and count stitches and look at it from all sides and just really look at it. And I was perfectly happy that nobody wanted to come with me because that meant that they wouldn't get bored. So, um, so I get to the Victoria and Albert Museum. I'm standing outside waiting for them to open. And I get my little map to where, where is it? Where is it? And I go up there. I'm looking in the room. I'm like looking at every display case. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I can't, I can't find the knitting. And so I went over to one of the docents and I asked him, I said, there's supposed to be like these really old examples of knitting you know do you know where that would be and so the docent went and looked back and came back and said oh that's not on display right now only about 10 percent of our collection is on display <laughs> which is that was when i learned that museums don't just have everything out that they own that very little of what they actually have is there i was so disappointed i, I just couldn't believe it because i've been looking forward to it for like a month hoping that i was going to have a chance to be able to get to the museum and so, and I planned for it and I got on the, oh, I was just so, so upset. So they had a bunch of other textile stuff going on in that museum. There was, and I think there was an area where there was a, a woman had donated all these knitted suits. Like she had hand knitted these suits in, I don't know, the 1940s or 50s or something. So those were all on. So that was interesting. That was not something I expected to see. And I'm like, well, that's okay. And then my husband texted me, um, the tour is today. We got the dates mixed up. When can you get back? So I had to rush out. So it, it turned out I was really disappointed that I didn't get to see what I wanted to see. Um, but I got to see something I didn't expect to see. And then the th and then I didn't have to, you know, feel disappointed about getting ripped away from the thing I wanted to see. So if the, if the knitting had been on display and then I had been like, we got to go back, you got to leave, I would have been, that would have been more disappointing, I think. So, and then it turned out that the tour was amazing. The woman who was our guide was like Encyclopedia Leona. She knew everything. You could ask her anything. She, would, she, she knew the answer. Um, so, so again, it turned out okay. Now, last year, um, because of, of the, all the genealogy I do, and I realized, like, I had never heard of um, the Protestant Reformation I didn't know anything about the Holy Roman Empire. I never heard of any of those things um, until I started doing genealogy and trying to figure out why did these people come here at the time they came, like what, what was going on? And then all of that historical information became relevant to me because it had something to do with why I'm here today. So last year during when, when the girls were home for winter break, there were people I kept hearing about, oh, there's this exhibit on at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. It's on Martin Luther and um, it's really amazing. You should go see it. So I, I was looking online. Well, what is it? Oh, well, the German museum where all of this stuff that was going to be on ex exhibit here, they were um, had lent all this stuff out to maybe two. I think it was just going to be in New York and Minneapolis, maybe one other city. And they were loaning them out for the year because they were refurbishing the, their museum in, in preparation for the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And so I was, so that, I'm like, oh, oh, that's what that is. Well, that would be interesting to, you know, to go see. And it was something to do. We were all in the girls like museums and, well, we'll go see. We had to get tickets and have special time to show up. And it, I'll go in there and it's like really crowded. Even though you had to have a ticket to get in, it was like really crowded and a lot of people. There are a lot of rooms with a lot of stuff. It's kind of like a, a lot to absorb. And I was walking through this one room and I was approaching, the, you know, the most of the rooms you just walk from one, they have just the open doorway. And this one was like, had closed doors. And I was looking at it like, well, is that closed off? And then I saw someone approach it and went, it's like on Star Trek, whoosh, you know, just open and then closed again. 
and I was like, oh, and I'm looking at, looking at the doors, walking toward them, and out of the corner of my eye, there's this rectangular glass case off to my right, and it, it, it's, like a, it's like a radar thing. It's like I saw a glove on display out of the corner of my eye, and I looked at it, and it was just like two, two you know, a couple of feet away from me, and I knew that that was a knitted glove, and I just knew it. You couldn't see the stitches from there. In fact, I had to get up next to the case, take my glasses off so I could, you know, I could see, I can see well when, without my glasses up close. And I'm looking, I'm looking at this glove. I'm like, it is knitted. It is knitted. I can't believe this. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. And I was looking at the, the fingers were like maybe an inch wide. And so I was counting stitches on the finger and they're like 20 stitches. So it's like, the gauge was like 20 stitches an inch. So it was this white glove and it had all this really elaborate embroidery and applique stuff on the back of the hand. And there's just one glove. And it was like such an unexpected surprise. And, and I was like almost overwhelmed. Like I couldn't believe I was looking at this um, glove and, and there was no, you know, the, the edge of the glove was just knitted all the way because the pearl stitch hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> so, and I'm like, where's the card for this? Where's the card for this? So I found the information card and it was like 500 year old glove. And I'm trying to do the math in my head. Like, is that even possible? Could that, is that accurate? Could that be right? Would they have had knitting in Germany 500 years? You know, I'm trying to think about like when knitting came into Europe and could that be accurate? And, and just like, oh, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I'm um, so excited. I got, there's one other woman who kind of heard me like how excited I was. And she got, I never would have known that that was knitted. Oh, that's so, thank you so much. So I was so excited. And, I, and then I finally went through the, the glass doors and to the other room. And, and then I saw a sign on the, on the wall. It said it was okay to take photographs if it wasn't a flash photography. So I like, turned around because I had assumed you couldn't take pictures of anything. Turned around, went back in there. I got my phone out. And I was trying to get a picture in focus of this glove and um, got the picture. And then because everybody else in my family, they were all, you know, in the next room. So but I forgot to get a, a picture of the card. So I was posting on Ravelry in the Loose Ends forum. I'm just like, are you guys, a 500 year old glove, so excited. And uh, this woman named Cynthia who said, oh, we're going to be driving, you know, back down through the cities on our way home at the end of, you know, December, beginning of January. Well, you know, if we have time, we'll, we'll stop in the museum. I said, you have to get tickets and they're really hard to get right now. So she went online, got tickets. And I said, if you go, can you take a picture of that? Of the little card because I can't remember exactly what they said it was made out of and uh, I, I just wanted the information so she did she went and she posted the information or she took a picture of it and then posted it in that thread and um, and it was like it was so you know I was one of those things where here I was going to this thing to learn about something um, that was, you know, interesting to me. And, uh, and then to, to find all of a sudden this 500 year old glove and to understand the significance of it, I think for me is part of what was so thrilling about it. So then in February, I went to one of the Minnesota Guild meetings. I don't, Knitters Guild meeting. I don't go very often. Like they're on Tuesday nights. And a lot of times if I'm uploading a video, I, I just, it doesn't work out. And, you know, they always have good programs every month and I keep thinking, oh, I should go, I should go. And then I don't. Um, well, in February, they always have like for members only, because normally anybody can go to one of the programs. For members only, they have a tea and they do it on a Sunday afternoon and there's no program. They just, it's just purely social. So I went to that last month and then somebody stood up and said, oh, there's this um, in celebration of the Latvian 100th anniversary of Latvian independence, there's this a suitcase exhibition of a bunch of Latvian mittens that is going from place to place um, around the country. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. You know, and I do that a lot when they announce these things that they go, oh, that's interesting that I never do anything about it. So I put it in my phone, like remind, you know, to put it in my phone to remind me to go look it up and get the date and find out all the information about when it was going to be there. So I got home and I did remember to look it up and it was going to, it, it's here March 20th to 30th, 10th to 20th. What's today? 
oh, it's the 10th to the 20th. So, um, so it was uh, last Saturday was when they were going to have a little program, like there's something going to be talking about all of it, an informal tour of the Mitten exhibition and all that. So I, I gave myself a 24-hour alarm, so it would be on my radar. And then a two-hour alarm, so if I had forgotten about it and hadn't taken a shower, I could get it in the shower. And then I gave myself a half-hour alarm, so to remind me of when to leave. Because what happens with me is, okay, I need to do something. Oh, I've got two hours, and I get all absorbed in something, and then time flies, and I forget it. So I'd set these three alarms. So last Saturday, I'm sitting at my desk about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, jeez, you know, I thought the Latvian mitten expedition or exhibition was supposed to be sometime around now i'm gonna look it up on my calendar because i didn't get an alarm so it must not be this weekend so i i open up my calendar and the event was still open like i was it was open for editing like i had set all the alarms and then i had never closed the event so that it would actually show up in my calendar so i missed i missed it and I was really mad at myself about it. I thought, well, you know, the exhibition is still going on. I missed the program, but the exhibition is still going on. So, so yesterday morning, um, I drove down to, it's at this uh, Scandinavian store. Like they have Scandinavian foods and products and it's called Inga Bretzens. And um, they have knitting classes and a lot of stuff there. They they have a lot of knitting related things going on, and again, I had never been there. Like I'd never taken the time to go see any of the knitting related stuff that they that they have there, and that's you know only there once in a while. Never never did it. I don't know why. I just never did. So I thought, I'm going to go to this exhibition. So I went in there yesterday, and there were there was I'm like they had them hanging from the ceiling and around this table, but there were there was a meeting going on at the table and. And so I'm like, oh, I wanted to see the mittens. And they're like, no, no, you can do it. And the women were in this meeting. And I'm like, is that okay with you if I videotape these mittens? Because then I was like, I can't just stand behind somebody who's sitting in a chair and then stare at these. I just, it was a little weird. So I, I was videotaping all the mittens. And then I saw there were information signs about... They had different designs in different provinces or different regions of Lithuania. So then I really started to actually look at the mittens because I was so kind of hyper aware of the people that were sitting there that I was kind of like, oh, I'll just videotape and then leave and look at the videotape. So I started realizing that, oh, the cuffs are different. They have different embellishments they do. They, they use different colors, different types of pattern. It was really, it was really interesting. So I, I kept going around more and more. Um, they have some other kind of thing that's going on tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, some sort of talk about, I think, just Latvia in general. Um, but I had never really, I had never paid any attention to Latvian knitting at all. Um, it's... And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. And then looking at the map and seeing how close it is to Estonia. And then you look across the Baltic and then you start getting Finland and you get uh, Sweden and Norway. And, and then you get the Shetland Islands and you start to see how these stranded color work things are kind of related, but they all are different. They all of it influenced each other. And so they're having a, a Latvian mitten class. There's a woman, a Latvian woman, who's going to be teaching a Latvian mitten class. Now, I could get a pattern and I could knit it just fine on my own. But I thought, you know, this could be really interesting. So I'm taking the class because it starts on my birthday's next Saturday. So I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do for my birthday. I'm going to get myself this uh, more in-depth Latvian mitten experience just to just to just to do it so so it was kind of a weird uh experience of the exhibition it wasn't quite what i was thinking you know with this meeting going on and i was really disappointed to have missed the program but i still i'm still glad i went because then it it i saw them and i learned something about them i learned something about this inga bretzens i'd never been there and i kind of saw what they have they have yarn and stuff there and they teach classes. I just never, I just never looked into it. And uh, so I think even if I end up disappointed by the experience that I thought I was going to have, it seems like it turns out that it, that I end up with something else that's just as good. It's different, but maybe just as good. 
So, so that's the kind of rut thing I'm trying, I'm talking about. It's like, I just kind of, you know, I let things go. I don't, I don't push myself and, uh, I, I want to push myself and not, not look so much on the surface of what something is, whether it's a sock heel or, um, or a knitting experience that I've never thought about, never was on my radar. Just, just try it. Just go see, go see what it is. Uh, look, look for things and, um, and it's only going to make my knitting better. And it's probably only going to enrich my just sort of sense of self. I don't know. I don't want to get too philosophical, but I don't know. So I'm just trying to get myself out of those ruts. I think, and I think the ruts, the ruts can happen, like, I think the ruts can happen whether you're experienced or inexperienced. Then when I was an inexperienced knitter, I wanted to try all the things. And then when I tried all the things, or what I thought was all the things, then I was in this rut for 18, 19 years. I just, I didn't push myself anymore. I just stayed even. And so I really, I need to, to find ways to constantly push myself. I think otherwise, um, I'm not gonna, it's just not gonna, I think things are more interesting when I'm learning more and I'm like, I'm always learning in the techniques area, but I think that's kind of a rut too, where like, oh, I'm comfortable here. I'm comfortable in, in the, um, this particular area. And somebody is telling me, this information about another area so i it's easy for me to dismiss and just make a judgment about it so that's what i'm going to try to do is not be so judgmental or just be more open-minded and conscious of the ruts that i might be getting myself into oh so if you are interested in this latvian mitten exhibition well it's going to be here in, in minneapolis till the 20th at inga bretson's on lake street but um, it's traveling. They they pack it up in a suitcase and they send it off to different places. Sometimes it's it's displayed in uh, yard shops and sometimes it's in like churches or in, I don't know if it's been in certain museums or or I'm not sure how they decide where it's where to um, put it. But there's a Facebook group for the exhibition and I went. I'll put it linked down below. And I asked if there was a calendar because I couldn't find like, how do you figure out where it's going next? And she said she was going to put, she was going to create one this weekend. Um, and so if you go to that Facebook group and, and you don't see the calendar, you can even just post and ask, is it going to come to my city or somewhere near my city at all in the next few months or something? I don't know how long this thing is going to be traveling around, but, um, but it's interesting. It's something, something to do. And uh, I just, it's fun to get out in the community and see what's going on. You know, I've lived here for 30 years and I've never been to Ingebret since I've been hearing about it for years, never been there. So that was worth going. So that's it for this casual Friday. Uh, I hope you can get yourself out of any sort of knitting ruts that you might be in. And I'd love to hear things that you might do um, to expand your knitting horizons. You can leave those down in the comments below um, or on the uh, Ravelry group you can um, let me know in one of the threads on there. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.